overview of everything, everything that you want to know that's the background to the old heart music. So, so we start with a map. I love maps. I think it was Karen Lewis who said that if a book didn't have a map in, she wasn't interested. <laughs> so, I, so I always try to put a map into all my books and things. squinted the map because yeah, because you see when well there's not an island straight it's because I'm not just interested in Ireland okay because Ireland is only a part of the old Gaelic world so nowadays we have national boundaries and we, we can kind of cut off at the edge of the nation state but um, but in when you go further back the, the modern nation states don't make so much state sense. And so the area that we're really <coughs> interested in for these historical traditions we're studying is this strip up the middle of our map, okay? So you've got the whole of Ireland, but you've also got the western part of Scotland. And the map doesn't have any roads on it, because back in medieval times we hadn't started building all the networks of military roads that were financed from London to be able to control things. And so you see the easiest way to get from any around is by sea, and you see where the connections are easiest is where there's lots of sea coasts and lots of sort of indented things. And so this area here, this is like the kind of Heathrow Airport of the old Gaelic world, this connection between the North of Ireland and the southwest of Scotland. And it's interesting that this area here is where the old heart traditions were the strongest for a long time. So I've put kind of slightly random selection of place names on your map. So um, I put Kilkenny here, because that's where we are. McGilligan here, this is where Dennis and Hampsey is from, you know, the heartland of the, of the tradition, right at the late end, which is in the north here. The McGilligan, where Dennis and Hampsey was from. The Fuse, where Patrick Quinn was from. Belfast, where the festival was. You see, they're all facing over to the, to the southwest of Scotland. So this is just something to think about when we're talking about places and people. And you can also write in when people, whenever anybody says where a tune comes from, where a harp comes from, you can just ask, where is this on the map? And write it in. You know, it helps you understand travelling from one place to another and the connections between the different families and what have you. So, so we've talked about the old Gaelic world a little bit. What we're interested in is early Irish harps, or early Gaelic harps. Okay, so... Um, you can think about three things there. What do we mean by when you say early Irish harps? We mean historical. We mean the old tradition, okay, that goes right back. And when we say uh, when we say early, we really are meaning not just claiming that our tradition is old, but also because anybody can claim their tradition is old. You can never abide with a modern tradition that is old, but is new at the same time. You know, is it quite is it quite possible to compose a brand new song or tune in an old tradition? When we say we talk about early, it's, it's a slightly different approach. It's like you're actively trying to look back to what happened hundreds of years ago and trying to understand it on its own terms. Yeah? You're not trying to reinterpret it in a modern style or idiom. You're trying to un understand and respect it in its, on its own terms as an ancient thing. Yeah? Does that make sense? So you've got early, you've got Gaelic, you've got the old Gaelic world, and you've got heart. So we all understand what we all understand what we mean by a harp, and it's worth talking about because there are other instruments that are not necessarily connected. Um, and so, what harp is a funny word in musical in musical instrument names. You've got different names for different types of instruments, and the names can be wider or narrower. And harp is an incredibly wide term. It's almost as wide as whistle. You know, every culture in the world has a whistle, and there's hundred, millions of different shapes and sizes of whistles that work in different ways. Same with harps. 
there is different harp traditions all over the world, all completely independent. Because the only thing that makes a harp is that it has strings running up away from the same rock so you can get at both sides. If it has that, it's a harp. But like I say, that is a very simple idea and it develops all over the world in different places independently. So you have Chinese harps, you have, you have hundreds of different kinds of African harps. And in the old Gallic world, there's a, very, there's a particular type of harp that's different from all others. It's very particular, it's very developed, and it stays quite conservatively similar for a long period of time, from over a thousand years ago, right up to, to the 19th century. Okay? And that's, that's the harp tradition that we're interested in. Okay, but it, it's worth remembering, it's, it's specific to Ireland and Scotland. So what I've done here, yep, this is the right one. So, th so this, is a, this is a useful list. So, so I said this harp tradition from Ireland and Scotland, and so I've made a list of all the harps that survive in museums. Because this, this is one of the ways that you define the tradition, is you say, well, there's harps, from old Ireland and Scotland from hundreds of years ago, from medieval times right through to the 19th century. The first thing you want to do is you want to get the old instruments and line them up so you can look at the actual instruments and see what they look like. So, this is your handy reference sheet to all of the old instruments that I know of. And I line them up for you. So, to, to, to I'm not expecting you to read and digest this sheet right now. This is something you can take away that you can refer back to um, at, at a later date. If you've got a spare, can I have one? Because well, I'm, well, 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 I'm running short. Thank you. So I've lined them all up. So at the top you've got the medieval ones, and at the bottom you've got the 19th century, 18th century ones. Okay? Anybody got any comments? Can you see? Who thinks there's not very many? Who thinks there's tons? Yeah, so, 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 so it's both. There's not very many because if, imagine if you had to draw a sheet of paper and put all the old violins in the world lined up. You'd need an awful big sheet of paper. So there's not many hearts because they all fit on one A4 sheet. But on the other hand, there's rather a lot because this is squeezed to fit them on a sheet. So it's kind of interesting because, like I said, there are some old traditions, like the old violin tradition, where there are tens of thousands of old violins in museums in private hands. But there are other ancient musical instrument traditions, like the medieval Welsh harp traditions, where there is nothing. There is not a single instrument, not even a bit of an instrument. There's barely even a picture of one. So actually, we're, so actually for an old tradition, I think this is a fairly okay. We've got a reasonable number. Can you see that they kind of, th there's, there's a great difference. You know, compare the ones in opposite corners. They're quite different in shape and size. But on the other hand, they do clearly fall into kind of groupings. You see these three at the top are quite similar in shape and size. Look at the ones down the bottom. They're kind of similar in shape and size. So can you see that you, you can kind of group them into families of similar shape and size of hearts, yeah? So at the top here, you've got the the medieval harps, and we call these low-headed because the head of the harp is relatively low. And I'll show you some examples of, of these things. Hello, thank you. This is the most famous of the medieval low-headed harps. Which one's this? So this is the harp in Trinity College in Dublin. You might recognise some of the people hanging around looking at it as well. And if you come on the field trip on Tuesday, you'll see this, just like that. <coughs> oh, this picture, because you can kind of see how big it is. Uh, well, you really know how big it is. You know what the Trinity College heart looks like, because some of you are playing copies of it this week. Okay. The next one on your list, here it is. Which one's this one? Queen Mary. Queen Mary. This is the Queen Mary heart which lives in Edinburgh in the National Museum. It's, it's almost identical to the Trinity College harp. It has the same number of strings, same, the strings are the same length, with the same layer. You know, it's, it's a matching pair, <coughs> basically. And some of you have got Queen Mary harps that you're playing on the course this week, yeah? So if you, if you have a chance, 
you should get the Trinity and the Queen Mary and put them side by side and, and try and spot the difference and spot the similarity. That's quite an interesting challenge. I, I remember, when would it be? Seven, eight years ago, when we first got the student trinities, the very first student trinities sent over from America, and I had, a, I had a, very, a basic Queen Mary hub, and I had them both in my living room, and I put them side by side, and I thought, wow, I've never ever seen these two models side by side, and how intriguing. I mean, now it's just kind of normal, you know, it's no problem to have ten trinities and five Queen Mary all in a room. But it's just seven years ago, it was like wildly exotic to have one of each at the same time. So there's the Queen Mary heart. Which one's this one? Lamont. This is the Lamont heart. This one lives in uh, Edinburgh as well. Now I have questions about the Lamont heart. It has a traditional story connected to it that says that it's also medieval from 1450 or something like that. But I'm looking at it and I think it doesn't look the same as the other ones, does it? Queen Mary half and the Trinity half are covered in decoration. They're, they're very medieval in their form and their shape. But this is different. Let's go back to the Queen Mary again. Can you see that all the, in, all the decoration, all the carving, all the shaping is very medieval? It looks like a medieval manuscript page covered in writhing animals and vines. Let's go back to the Lamont half. How would you describe the, the form and the design of that half? Yeah. It's very plain, it's very austere. It's quite, it's quite severe in its kind of rectangular, rectangular shape. And so, so people are starting to ask questions, is it actually more modern than that? I think Karen's going to talk about this, but it's, it's important to keep an open mind with these things. That people are too quick to label what is the date of certain instruments and give, give a kind of pat summary of this belongs here, this belongs here. There's a lot of there's a lot of open questions. There's more open questions than some people let on, some of the, some of the experts let on. So it's always, good to, it's always good to question, it's always good to ask. Which one's this one? This is the Otway half. You'll, you'll see this one on Tuesday because it's in Dublin. It's further down your list. Can you, can you see on your chart that it's bigger? Okay. <laughs> Everyone always says over, over time, the early Irish harp grew. And I like to imagine it with its feet in a pot. It wasn't like that really. You know, the actual harp stayed the same size, but new harps were made bigger than old harps. Yeah? The old harps stayed the same size. The harp was started shrinking. The harp was started shrinking. Well, that's possible as well. <laughs> we don't know how old this one is well. Pe people make wild guesses about how old it is. But uh, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about this on, on Tuesday because there's very interesting questions about the date and provenance of this half. What about this one? This is a much younger version of Anne when she was in Dublin in the 90s, I guess, visiting Guinness. Is it and the <laughs> Looking at the downhill half. And so I love this photo because I, it's very sweet. But um, no, it's, it's great to, sit, to get the size and the, and the, and the way the heart, heart fits together. And I think in that picture she's found where Nicole is and she's placing her hands from the beginning as a Burns March. So, it, so it's very nice. But the downhill heart. And why is the downhill heart the most, one of the most important? It's not the oldest part, is it? But why is it the most important? Because of a, because of a hemp seat connection. Because Edward Bunting visited Dennis Ahampsey and wrote down so much of his music. And because Dennis Ahampsey had the oldest music and the most interesting traditions. And so that, that half is the direct connection between Bunting's manuscripts, which he wrote down while he was sitting next to Dennis Ahampsey, and Dennis Ahampsey playing the old music. And so, so the connection between the manuscript pages and the harp and the old traditions is, is it's really direct and really connected. And that's why we have student versions of the downhill half that some of you are playing. Okay? And we'll see this half on Tuesday as well, because it's kept in Guinnesses in, in Dublin. And also, we just, it's not the only half, but we have the, all the notes written down, which notes... Oh yeah, I mean, the, 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 so, so, so like Barbara says, one, one of the pages of Bunting's notes, well, he writes down every single note and every single string on the half, that, that kind of thing. There's a, there's a lot of very specific information tied, 
and I did this harp and, it's, and the repertory that was played on it. Last year I talked about the connection between specific repertory settings and specific surviving instruments because if you play, if you play the same tune on two different harps, you're going to make different decisions of, regarding how you interpret the bass, what kind of ornaments you use, how high you take the tune, because you don't want to run off the top of the range, but you want to make maximum use of the, what bass note you have, that kind of question. So having the actual settings of a Herpsey's tunes with their basses in Manuscript 29, taken direct from a Herpsey, and the instrument that he, that he played them on with its particular sonority and range. That's interesting to think about that. It's, it's worthwhile, while you're here, try comparing the different models of harp. Uh, who, who here hasn't had a, tried playing a student downhill harp? That's quite a few people who haven't tried playing a student downhill harp. Yet there's loads in the room. This is a great opportunity to actually get a feel. What's the downhill like to play? How do your arms reach around it? What kind of sound quality does it have? It has a very different sound from the smaller medieval harps. I would say it's much more growly, it's, got, it's louder, it's got a more kind of penetrating sound. But that affects how, what choices you make about how to play the bass, how to play it, what kind of chords to play, that kind of thing. So do take the opportunity to, tr to, to get a downhill, play a few things, get a trinity, play a few things. What's the difference? It's really important to understand these differences. And this is your chance to do it, because you can't do it at home. Well, you can, if, you, you can if you've got a huge harp collection, but most of us don't. Okay. <coughs> what about this one? Sounds hard. Okay, th this is what happens if you take all the strings off and pull the harps to pieces. And I always say, don't try this at home, because it's very scary. But this, is, but the the idea of this, this is um, this is a kind of, this is a student Queen Mary, not one of our student Queen Mary, a different one. That um, that I pulled to pieces, and I thought this is really cool. You can see all the bits because you don't often get to see this. Um, so this shows you how the harp fits together. So, so there are four pieces of wood, okay? Um, each of them is carved from a huge block of timber. It's not glued up like a, like a violin or a guitar. And then, can you see how these joints are cut? So you've got this kind of square tenon, and you've got a square mortise cut, and it, they fit in, they press in, and then you put the strings on the harp and it kind of squashes them all down. But if you take the strings off, they all just pull apart. And, that's, and, and there's lots of interesting things that come out of that. One is it makes the heart more alive because it changes shape with humidity and temperature. So the heart changes shape a little bit. So for those of you who have been looking at Natalie's new Queen Mary house, you notice that some of the joints don't quite fit. Well, they're not meant... Well, they, they can't because as the heart changes shape with temperature and humidity, angles will change a little bit so they open up and close down. So even if you made them a perfect fit, you come in the next morning, they'd all be shifted a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Mine was made like that and it's got yeah. so, so it's completely normal. So so don't ever be panic if you see if you if you're looking at a harp and, it's, and it, the joints are opening a little bit. That's what they're meant to do. And if you glue all the joints solid like some harp makers want to, it stops the harp living and breathing so well. So that's something to bear in mind, you know? Look, look at the, always look at those, the, the joints and see how they're opening. It's kind of interesting. And you can see it on the old harps as well. Okay, there's another, there's another thing that this means. If you take the strings off the harp, you can put it into pieces. So what happens if a part of your harp breaks or is damaged? You take the strings off, you pull the harp to pieces, you, get, you make the new piece, put it back together, okay? And we suspect that that's happened with some of the old harps. In fact, we're pretty certain that that's happened with some of the old harps, but then you have the question, which old harps? Which old harps are complete and which have bits replaced? And another thing you can do, imagine, imagine a harp workshop and a beaten up old harp comes in that's a bit kind of falling to pieces. You could, put it, you could take the strings off, pull it to parts and put them in the spare parts box. And then someone then comes in to buy a harp and you pull out a neck from here, a pillow from here, a sandbox from here, and yeah, so, so these are possibilities. It's not, it's not a crazy idea to think that a harp could be a composite of three different, three different harps. And, it's thin, and the part is too long, you just chop it. You can shorten it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, I don't know, if, last year Karen talked about evidence for shortening of sections, didn't she? I think it's the mammoth harp. Yeah. <laughs> to 
go back to the lemon cart and, and just mention that. <laughs> Karen did um, an X-ray through the X-ray through the top here, and you see here's the pillar, and it has its tenon that goes up here, and there's a row of holes in the tenon where the pegs go through, and then there was notches where there was a second row of holes where it had been shortened. So there's all these kind of things going on. We don't know that much about it at the moment, and we have to do more research. So it's all a big work in progress. <coughs> right. Yeah, so, so, so the more we study the old harps, the more we learn about them. And one of the things that, that I'm learning more and more as we study them, and this especially comes out of Karen's work, is how high quality the old harps were. And this fits into this early music approach, this trying to understand the historical music on its own terms. It's easy as a modern instrument maker to look at the old harps and design something new that kind of has the old ambience, but it'll be a new instrument to a new design. And do you know what? The old harps are much, much more subtle and complicated than any new ones that I've seen. And that's kind of interesting. And the more we study the old ones, the more subtle stuff we find out about them. So I have no qualms at all about saying none of the harps in this building are as good as the ones we'll see on Tuesday in terms of quality, in terms of build quality, in terms of the subtlety of their decoration, their shaping, their structure, their acoustical profiling of the sound box. The old harps are much better than anything we have today. And that's kind of interesting as well. That's something to think about. So how, you know, how do we make our hearts better? Well, the way must, to make... The way it, it must be something to do with experience. Is it, yeah, exactly. The, thing with that, the, the centers of experimentation yes, yes. And, and, and deep concern Yes, um, because it's at the centre of culture. So the old heart makers were in a very old, strong tradition. And, yeah. and culture involving a, a, yeah. an audience as well as yes. the players. Everyone the knew. Everyone knew the music. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone was immersed in it, and so everyone demanded the highest standards. But the instrument makers were in that rich, broad tradition. They spent. You know, they could. They had centuries, generations of experience to draw. Whereas nowadays, the instrument makers are working as hard as they can, but they're not in that living tradition, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to discover it anew, so I think that's why. So the way, the way that they can get better is by more intensive study of the old ones, I think, yeah? So the more research we do to try and find out tiny, tiny subtleties about how the old ones were, were shaped, constructed, put together, the, the more detail we find out about the exact way in which they were carved, we can then use those details for our heart makers to make better instruments, and then our instruments will be made better. So Natalie's doing this. Um, for her most recent Queen Mary harps, she took some of the research that Karen had done on the exact profiling, the, the shaping, the carving of the inside of the sound box of the Queen Mary harp, because it's thinner in some places. It's thinner at the treble, it's thicker at the bass, but it's thinner on one side and thicker on the other. And so Natalie took Karen's measurements and carved the inside of her sound box with that thickness and thinness, and guess what? It produces a better sound. Oh. Okay. But there's hundreds of other things that need studied, and it also incorporates just for the Queen Mary harp. And then that work hasn't been done on the Trinity College harp at all. So when it is, then we'll be able to start making better Trinity College replicas. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's a continual process, but there's so much work that still needs to be done. But the results of the work are that we can continue, continually get better and better instruments. Okay. <clears throat> so, yes, Bob, you mentioned the, um, the whole cultural scene. That's something that's worth just picking up on a little bit. So, one of, the, one of the funny things about his, historical music, early music, is that, and, and people joke about this, is that you can be as authentic as you like. You know, you can, you, you can have the exact replica instrument if you play fiddle or lute 
or harpsichord, you can actually have a real 100, 300 year old one. We can't do that with the harps because the old ones are too rare and too fragile to string and play. But you can have the most exact replica. You can use a historic building as your venue. You can research your music from the manuscripts and play the exactly what the old people played. You can even have medieval toilets if you want to be super authentic and medieval underwear. But your audience won't have medieval ears. Mm -hmm. You would have to have a hand-picked, vetted audience who had never heard jazz or rock, never heard amplified music, never heard Mozart, because he's too modern. It's not going to happen, you know? I suppose you could, you could, you could, you could take, a, you could take um, orphans and, and seclude them away in a little school and only, only let them hear plain chant, and then perform the ancient music to them, but I might be taking it too far. There's very few medieval trees left as well. Mm. Yeah, so that's right. So even the materials you make the harp from have changed. And even if you have an ancient instrument to play, like I said, you can't play their ancient harps, but even if you could, they're ancient. So th they've changed. So what's the point? But um, obviously there's a point because it's beautiful and, it's, and we learn so much by trying it. But there's this interesting idea that you can't get the ancient audience, but you can think about the way in which the ancient music was played. I mean, one of the things is, tonight we're all going to the concerts, and so we'll go off to the chapter house and we'll sit in seats, and there'll be the artists on stage, and they'll stand up you know, with a light on them, and they'll play a tune, and everyone will clap. That's not how it was done in, in ancient times. They didn't have concerts. Concerts are quite a modern idea. Just the idea of you know, paying, paying to get a ticket to get in, taking your seat, you know? Um, neither did they have, I think this is very important actually, especially for football, they didn't have the expectation that's been set up by recording, whereby everything is perfect. Yes. So yes. it's very possible that performing and ex uh, the, the expectation would be very different. If people stopped and started, so what? Yes. But we're used to seeing pre-prepared material, yes. something recorded yes. again and again and yes. again. So our expectations are yes. utterly different. From so that. I think actually that last night's thing, where everyone was sitting around and it was very informal, people could chat while you were playing or discuss your, your playing or join in a little bit or, you know, these are, think, these are ideas we're thinking about. So in the old Gallic world, the way that this kind of music was used, it was domestic mu music. And I mean, you know, music at home. And the home might be very grand, it might be a castle, and you might be a, great, a grand prince, or a petty king, and you might have a court, you know, with retainers and warriors, and, and you, would have, you would have your court poet, and his job would be to compose poems. He's a bit like, I guess the nearest modern thing is the spin doctor, you know, who goes around with politicians and writes their speeches and does their press releases. That's what the poet is doing. He's composing compelling narrative that tells how great you are, your, your noble genealogy, your great deeds. And then the way that it was presented in this traditional society is your poet produces the, the, these fantastically complicated and ornate texts. He doesn't sing, he doesn't present them because he's the poet. He's 100% committed to the, to the composition of the words. You have a, a singer or a, a reciter who sings the text, sings the poem. Okay? And the singing is accompanied by the harper who plays on the early Irish harp and accompany this presentation. And this presentation is, is a little bit like when you see a government minister up, come up on television to make some announcement about the economy. You know, it's public relations. It's presenting. It's, it's the public face of the aristocracy, of the patrons. So, so you have to imagine, that that's, that's kind of how this music works in the oldest strands of the traditions. It's very formal, it's very public, it's presenting a kind of a worldview. This is, this is our world, this is our old Gallic society. This is the way, that, you know, we're the, we're the natural leaders. We, we have these thousands of years of heritage in our old society, and this is how things are. So, that's something to think about as well for this old music. It certainly is not just background music, pleasant sounds to listen to to while away an evening. Okay? It's really deeply embedded in the whole social structures and in, in people's ideas of what their society is, where it's going, where it comes from. And yes, great point about recording. Who here has never listened to a recording? Well, that instantly rules all of you out as having any idea about what it's like to have been a musician 200 years ago. Because musicians 200 years ago had never, ever heard recordings, did they? Okay? They only ever heard it live. There's a wonderful anecdote that I came across. Um, 
you know when, when audio recording was invented and first became widespread? Not much more than 100 years ago. Okay, so only 100 years ago. Did you even have recording? This is so important. I was so impressed by it. Um, the the um, Tortelier, the cellist, had met a very odd man, so I have, I mean, um, that, had, that remembered hearing Liszt play the piano. And he was fascinated because Liszt was famous yes. throughout the Western world for, for his virtuosity. And he said, well, what was it like to hear him? And he said, well, he was messy. He made loads of mistakes. Yes. But it didn't matter yes. because nobody ever heard anything other than yes. that. I know it's not relevant no, to the no, it's theory, very relevant. But, but, but it's very relevant to the yes. whole idea of pre-recorded material and, and actually living without the notion of pre-recorded yes. material. Yes. So that's Liszt, the most famous, yes. as American made mistakes. All right, Liszt. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, so think, think, imagine yourself listening to a piece of music. I want you to do that now. Imagine, imagine a nice piece of, mu of, of early Irish harp music. Imagine yourself listening to it. Okay, where's the music coming from? Where's the, where's the music physically coming from? From the harp. So you mean there's actually a person in the room yeah. and they're playing the harp. Who's the person? Swans. Oh, <laughs> this is good because, because I bet most people nowadays, if you said that, they say, oh, the music's coming from my earbud. Or from, or from the music's coming from here, you know? So, so, so this is another thing to be worth thinking of. And yet, and yet you say you say you're writing the music coming from a harp, yeah. and perhaps it's Siobhan playing it. Okay, now think all the times in your life, or in the last year, that you've heard early Irish harp music. Okay? What percentage of those has the music come from a harp, and what percentage has it come from a loudspeaker? More than 50% from a loudspeaker? Yeah. So you haven't really been listening to harp music at all, you've been listening to loudspeaker music. Okay. This is important, okay? Because there's not a person behind here going like this, okay? It's all mechanical. So, so this is really important idea. This, this, is, this is how music works, okay? Is that there's a person, and in their head they have an idea, and their fingers wriggle, and they twang these metal things that comes through the wood and out into the air, and you hear it. And there's there's a direct connection between two people, okay? And I think that's really important. That's what music is for. Yeah. And so you can all stand back and say, that was a bad note there. Who cares if there's a connection between one person and another? Yeah? You don't sit, you don't sit in a cafe looking at, looking at people having an intimate meeting and saying, the grammar of what he said wasn't very good. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, you do, but you do notice when it's a recording, because you, do the same, you listen to the same thing over and over again mechanically, you start to pick up. If you, if you have a film, of two people in a cafe having an intimate meeting, and one of them says a thing that's ungrammatical. Every time you see the film, you'll spot it, and there'll be internet message boards where people describe it and discuss it, yeah? So, be aware of this. Okay, well, that was a bit of a digression, wasn't it? What are we going to talk about next? Oh, repertory. Let's talk about, let's talk about repertory, because that's kind of important, because I mean, you can do free improvisation. Who here does free improvisation on the harp? I do, because it's kind of fun. You just sit at the harp and you just go, mm -hmm. you're not going to dream well. But really, that, that, that really, as part of his... Oh, who here thinks that the old harpers did free improvisation, just sat there at the harp and made stuff up? Yeah, a lot, a lot more people think the old harpers did it than actually do it now. Why is that? I'm oh, sorry, I just put on my hand. Uh, yeah, because... If the old harpers, if it was good enough for the old harpers, why isn't it good enough for us? Partly they didn't have all the tunes that we have to That's play. true. They had to make them up in the yes. first place. Yes. So that part good point. I think some people are afraid to be judged for what, that they do yes. something in. Well, this is interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so the old harpers, like the old harp makers, they were in the tradition. They had it in them. So anything they came out with within the tradition, you know? They had, they had a kind of inner confidence. We don't have that because we're not in the tradition. In fact, this is, a, this is the great postmodern thing that we don't, a lot of people say we don't have any tradition. We're kind of flapping around in this kind of world of millions of choices. You can go on iTunes and you can get any music from anywhere in the world instantly, totally out of context. You know, we have no tradition. And so we feel very insecure and so we don't have that ability just to, just to, just to put stuff out that's genuine. So, 
and we have to think about it. So yeah, but the, the other thing is this repertory, this idea that there are, there are tunes that belong to our tradition. So I've, this is a new experiment. So this is very much a work in progress, this handout. Pretty so it's going to change nice. a lot. Yes, this, I, I don't normally do colour handouts either, so this is kind of cool. So this is something to take away and think about as well. But the idea here is this is like a map of the repertory. So, so what I've written in black is my idea of... of the whole world of the old Gallic harp repertory. And what I've written in colour is specific areas or items or groups that we have surviving from times in the past. So what does anybody, anybody got any comments? There's, 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 I, I, I a lot of blue, you. not a lot of red. Yeah, there's a lot of blue, which is, post, which is you know, the modern stuff, basically. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? Because the, the more modern you get, the more stuff gets written down. There's nothing in the right top right. There's nothing in the top right hand corner. Does anyone notice that? Yeah. There's not much in this one. There's not even much in the bottom right hand corner. And yet, that's half the repertory, is, the, is what I've labelled geometric music. So, music that is very formal, very structured, very architectural. You can see the kind of stuff it is because of what I put around the outside. Pebrock and Robert Up Hugh. That kind of stuff. You know, everyone understand what I mean by that? These very kind of minimalist variation sets, very repetitive, very structured. Not a lot of free melodic lyrical movement there. Okay? And I think, that, I think it's fair to say that's half the repertory, or at least half the possible repertory, and yet we have almost nothing, yet we have virtually nothing surviving of it. And that's kind of interesting. Why do you think there's hardly anything surviving of it? Maybe it was extemporized. It might have been memorized, but it wasn't written down. That's the important thing. It wasn't written down. So it's lost. Whereas the stuff on the right hand side, this is the stuff that's melodic and lyrical. And, pe and, and that stuff appealed to people who were musically literate, like Edward Bunting, or like the fiddle players, or lute players, and they wrote it all down. And we can get their writing, and there we have it. Easy. Job done. Consider the Bardic poetry. I mean, yes. the, not specifically Bardic, but there's plenty of ancient poetry. Oh, the poetry yeah. survives, oh, but the music doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah precisely. Okay. So, so in the, in this chart, I'm being very strict and oh, narrow. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, so this is this is this is for the harp repertory. This oh. is for the harp music. So yes, of course, the poems survive, yeah, yeah. but the music, the, the melody to which the poem is sung, yeah. and the, how the harp accompanies, does not survive. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. you're quite right. Well done for pointing that out. Yes, the poetry survives. Not the music, but not the music for it. Wasn't bardic music, um, was it mainly improvised? Nobody knows. It's, it's, it's blank. Okay. I, I we, have, we have no I thought, idea. I thought I actually, I, I just thought I read that it was. Well, well people speculate. Yeah. People guess. But this, I, in this chart, I'm being very strict. And I'm saying this is what we know. Okay, that we just don't know. I mean, could it also imply that it was perhaps a slightly older aspect of the tradition that yes. why it's less of yes. excellent? Yes, I think I think the further back in time you go, you the more important this things. side is, and the and the more modern you get, the more important this side is. So yeah, that's when the stuff got written down. Think of Bunting writing down this his stuff. Bunting stuff is very securely on this side. In fact, I would say the only thing that Bunting wrote down that's on this side, the only harp music Bunting wrote on this side is Burns March. One example, and the only reason Burns March survived is because it was the teaching tune. It wasn't in their normal performing repertory. And so what about the dots and... Okay, the dots. This is, so, so then you have this challenge. We're in an oral tradition. and the, We're in an oral tradition. Don't, don't we respect the oral tradition and what it claims? And there are quite a lot of things in the oral tradition claim this is ancient music. Okay? Sometimes the claim is explicit. So for Burns March, there's a little manuscript annotation in, in Bunting's own copy of his 1809, where he says this tune was composed in the 13th century for the Burns around Newry. And obviously that's the information that he's got from a harper who was playing Burns March. And that's cool, you know, how exciting that Burns March is really a 13th century tune. And yet, we only have it written down in a late 18th century set. So that's why I put dots, because 
the tradition claim is it's that old, but we don't have it that old. Do you see what I mean? And the, cha yeah. the, the chances of it having not changed. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so th th that's the point. It, it, it's that old, but what do we mean by it? Can you play a late 18th century set and say that's exactly what it would be like in the 13th yeah. century? No, but do you see what I mean? You've got, you've got to do interpretative work. And this diagram is saying this is what you'd start your interpretative work from. I don't want interpretative work put onto here. I want this to be the absolute kind of baseline before we start interpreting. Because we have to interpret. Because we want to we want to hear this stuff. Yeah, we want to play this stuff. But we have to do the work first, the interpretative work. But do you, do you understand what I mean? Can you also use it as a dartboard? <laughs> oh, I'm like playing Rory no, on well, today. Like, it's like the crosshairs, isn't it? It's like the target, you know? And we're aiming for the centre of the tradition, and there it is with the three beginners too. So that's kind of fun as well. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> um, take this away, study it, and come back to me afterwards with your idea, because there's far too much to talk about here. We've got to move on to other things. But I have just two little things to think about here, and, and those things are one, what have I missed out? What things should I have put on here that I have not yet thought of? Because I'm sure I'm mi I've missed something that should go on here. And the second thing is, can you think of an example of every single genre that I've put on here? If you can, I'll be really impressed. Okay, but it should be possible. You know, if you if you if you start you, you've been studying the music with the tutors here, you've listened to their CDs. You should be able to find examples of every single genre or type that I've put on here. But that's a challenge for you to try and identify and listen to an example of everything there, okay? <coughs> Good. Anyway, let's move swiftly on because we're running short of time. Let's have a look at, let's, let's, let's have a little slideshow of people, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Okay, who's this? Carol Ann. Okay. Um, Anyone got anything to say about Carolyn? This picture. This is an oil painting of Carolyn. I think it was painted from life, so it's great to see an actual formal little portrait of him. What about his clothes? Yeah, what, it's an oil painting. What kind of image is Carolyn trying to put out to the world? Kind of gentleman. Well, he's blind, so he can't see the painting. That's the first thing to think. Caroline is sitting for a portrait that he can never see. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, he's, 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 dressed very, he's dressed as a formal gentleman, you know, he's, remember what Sharon said, Signor Carolini, he's, he's putting himself forward as, you know, I'm cosmopolitan, I'm up to date, I'm dressed, in, I'm dressed fashionably, I, I can go to a Dublin townhouse and make general conversation. Yeah. There's a light in the corner, I don't know if that's actually intended or if it's like, I think the painting is on a copper, it's quite a so small painting, it's on a copper sheet, so it could be that it's just scratched. Well, or it could be a kind of flash of inspiration, couldn't it? Well, it's, kind of, it's nice, yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Looks a bit scratchy to me. Maybe it's a scratch. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you say he's dressed formally as a gentleman, but look at the neck of his shirt. I'm not sure a gentleman would get away with, with being all kind of loose and... And, and undressed like that, you know, you should be all tied up and stiff. This is after a lot of drinking. After a lot of drinking, <laughs> yes, yes. So, so fast, he's a gentleman with his cuffs and his buttons, but he's also a kind of flamboyant, degenerate, drunken artist. Okay. What about his heart? It's kind of strange. The perspective's very odd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which was a very, very strange joint. Art, artists, artists generally are good at faces and bad at hearts. So you must never trust. When you, whenever you look at an a painting or a drawing of a person playing a harp, do not trust the harp. The artist is useless at harps. And a lot of people think that you can reconstruct the harp from a drawing. You can't. Although well, there is one point, uh, Andrew would be pleased, he's playing very near the sound Here's his thumb on the string, this far from the top, two thirds of the way up the string. Well. The, the, you're his finger. Yeah. Half of the string. You're right, actually. Yeah. You're right. But I suspect it was all like a terrible. Sorry. Part of his other arm. Just me. I'm just, I'm just having the trouble. I'm still looking at the joint between the. Yeah, it seems to be like. Yeah, but like I say, the, the artist gets the detail of the heart wrong, so I just don't trust it. 
Look how high the harp is. From his chin to the harp. Oh, yeah, he's holding the harp. He's the shortest flamboyant. Yeah, but he hasn't got the harp all up here. Yeah. Remember how Andrew held his harp with the top kind of up here? That's, you know, Carol's holding it nice and low. He's got the. Think of how there's some people here who are playing downhill harps and they've got them on a stool to lift them up. I don't, you know, I think the harp is, the harp is on the floor, it's low down. He's out, his hand is horizontal, it's not poking up. Anyway, he's spending too much time on Caroline. What about this one? Yeah. Another yeah. issue where I think the second people, there are no point of this going. The legs, his hands are already. Oh, yeah, but that was a good point, Paul. Caroline, was, Ka Caroline we saw his left hand high. Anyway, look, again, look at who, so who's this guy? This is, this is a man called William Archdeacon, and he was living in Ghent in Antwerp in about 1750. And he had this portrait painted of himself with his family. And he, he's of Irish descent. He's, a, he's one of the noble Irish families that moved to the continent. And so to show how Irish he is, he has himself painted with a harp. And I think it's the family harp, because the coat of arms on the front is his family arms. But he seems much keener on his heart than he does on his wife and children. <laughs> yes, oh yes. And the artist as well, as this artist is, you, this is a good yeah. heart, you can yeah. tell. <laughs> yeah, the family, okay. I, I, love, I love these family portraits because, because nothing, it's not like a family portrait nowadays, you know? When we have our group photo, everyone stands and looks and smiles. But in a portrait like this, everybody's doing something, and it's all symbolic. So look at the little baby. Yeah. Can you see it's pointing? It's pointing at the man. What about the little girl at the front? Look, what's what's she doing? That's not accidental. There's some there's some rhetorical gesture going on there. Andrew would be able to tell you this because he studies the gestures. There's, there's, me yeah, but there's, there's meaning to this shape here. It's got. It's got. You know. It's like mine. There's a. There's a. She's communicating, and I can't tell you what it is. And the lady in the back is reading music and pointing at the heart of it. Yeah, you can't see it on here, but this is a piece of music sheet. This is a music book she's got open, and there's, there's a tune here, and, and nobody's been able to decipher this tune because we don't have a good enough photo of the painting. And we can't get a better photo because the painting's in a private collection in the Netherlands. But um, one day, I hope, we'll get a, a good close-up of that section and we'll be able to see what the tune is. And she's, so she's holding the tune and she's pointing it Really much but how do you know the painting is detailed enough to capture the music? Of course it is. You can see that. It's just fuzzy. It's just fuzzy on the picture. <laughs> so, so the photo is of lower quality than the painting. It's not like the photo is detailed and we can see the fuzzy brush strokes. No, the photo is fuzzy. So we can get better than we have. It's probably, it's probably a question of intention. There are, I'm sorry about to go on about this, but there, there are paintings of lute players where you can actually, where, 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 where they've taken so much trouble that you can actually play the notes. You can see yes. the Oh, yes, oh, that's quite normal. Yeah. When you have music in a painting, it's, it's usually real. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually yeah. real music. And, it's, and again, I say everything's symbolic. So the music is, is, you know, it'll be his family march or something like that. It'll be a piece of music that's particularly special to him. And I really want to know what that tune is, because that would be really cool. Mm -hmm. But obviously they don't want you to know. So see him playing left hand high, right hand low. See how low he's holding his harp. Mm hmm. Right. Who's next? Who's this? It's an old bloke. It's an old bloke. Who is it? Some of you. Some of you. Miss Dennis a Hampsey. Yes. Very good. Did you actually recognise him? Were you guessing wildly? Well, I. I Yes, with a few hats and a lot more money. Yeah. But look, he's got his hat. His hat's on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know the famous portrait of the Miss Hampsey? Yeah. This is the one we used to be, we used to see in Bunting's 1809. Yeah. This is done from an engraving when Hampsey was old. But this is a different artist who's done this one, and this is in the. Um, this one you have to do. He's got the same coat and the same hat. Yeah. And that one wasn't quite as good as the hat. His hair is longer in that one, isn't it? So I wonder if he's a bit younger. But not much. But could, you can recognise his face, can't you? Um, the harp in this one is pretty good. It's the downhill harp. It hasn't got his head, 
because I think the head has fallen off. You can, if we run on Tuesday, you'll see there's a massive crack where the head joins the heart where it's been glued back on. So the head's fallen off. But apart from that, this is a downhill heart, no problem. But look at the heart in that picture. This is what I mean, artists don't do heart. They just don't get it. Look at the bottom of the heart, especially. It's absolute rubbish. Like that. Yeah. Really straight. There's no foot, there's no projecting block. You just kind of, ooh, let's just do some lines and draw it in. It looks a bit like the photo of Anne playing the statue. Yes, so. The grey statue. Look, and count the number of strings on the heart. It's just, it's just rubbish. Anyway. We're moving swiftly, aren't we? We're almost out of time, aren't we? Who's this? This is Patrick Quinn, yes. We don't normally see this picture. Um, I, I just found a good copy of it recently. There, there's two pictures of Patrick Quinn. This is the real painting done by um, Miss Trotter. Um, Ito was mentioning, what's his, is it Bernard Trotter? The guy who organized the Dublin Heart Society in 1809. Somebody help me here. What's this? What's Trotter's yeah, name? Bernard? Just, I'm not sure. Mr. Trotter, he, he, he found Quinn and he brought him to Dublin and engaged him as tutor to the Heart Society and got Quinn to play at the Caroline Balls. Well, his daughter did this oil painting at that time. And then the oil painting was engraved and the engraving was published. And so we used to see the engraving. You, know, you can find that anywhere. It's in Armstrong's book. It's on the front cover of my Progressive Lessons book. But this is the painting that that engraving was based on. And I think it's lovely to see him. It's the Otway half that I showed you earlier, the one in, um, in, we'll see in, on, in Dublin. He's sitting on a bit of a low seat. You see he's got the half on the ground, his left hand high. And he's got the Look how his, hand, his, hands, his hands are low, he's reaching down onto the half. He's not got the half up and he's reaching up onto it, he's reaching down onto it. He's kind of curling over it. the back range. Sorry? Do we know where it was painted, what the background is? Well, like I say, it was painted by Miss Trotter. No, but, but what the background is? Made up, I would guess. Made up. It's an, it's an artist who paints it, so of course they make it up, you know. They're only interested in him. And the half is not great. They haven't done the foot at the bottom of the half, and it's a bit sugary, but it's all right. You can recognise that it's the Otway half. Who's this? Arthur O'Neill. Arthur O'Neill, yes. Arthur O'Neill. Why is Arthur O'Neill important? Because of his memoirs. Who, who here has read Arthur O'Neill's memoirs? Very good. Okay, everyone who hasn't, you must. Okay, Arthur O'Neill's memoirs are great. <laughs> so what happened? Arthur O'Neill was, was one of the old harpers. Edward Bunting met him, um, took some tunes down off him uh, at Belfast and afterwards. But Arthur, Arthur O'Neill, Ita mentioned Arthur O'Neill because Arthur O'Neill was engaged to be the tutor at the Belfast Harp Society. Okay? So Arthur O'Neill was in Belfast in around 1800. He was tutor to the, to the young blind boys at the society. And Bunting knew him and was collecting tunes from him. And Bunting had a secretary, Scarrett, I think it was, something like that, I can't remember. Anyway, so, so Arthur O'Neill sat down. He was blind, so he couldn't write. So Arthur O'Neill sat down, and the secretary sat down, and Arthur O'Neill dictated his life story, and the secretary wrote it down. So it's basically my autobiography by Arthur O'Neill. And um, Arthur O'Neill was good, he was good at writing autobiography, so it's really lively. He talks all about uh, how he learned the heart and all the adventures. He, he, was, he was one of these kind of hard drinking, hard traveling, partying type of old harpers. So he was all over Ireland, he got into all kinds of scrapes, practical jokes, you know, all this kind of thing. It's really good, you must get Hold the bath when he doesn't memorize and read it. There's, 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 there's various copies of it around. So perhaps the easiest one is in the Caroline book. Oh. The whole of Arthur O'Neill's memoirs is in here. There's slightly different versions, but it's never been published properly. Um, he, he did it more than once, you know, he dictated his memoirs, then a year later he kind of came back and said, actually, you know, I could do better than that, so they did a second version, and then, then later he came back and said, oh, I've got some improvements, so there's, so there's three versions of the memoirs, and they've never really been collated and, and done comparatively. But yeah, def you, you must read Arthur O'Neill's memoirs, it's just so vivid a picture of how the old travelling harp has worked. Who's this? OK, 
Okay, this is Patrick Byrne. What's different about this one? This is different from the pictures I've been showing you up till now. Yeah, this is a photograph of one of the old harpers, and that's really cool. This is the only photo of one of the old harpers, because the old harp tradition died out before, really, before photography was invented. Let alone before audio recording was invented. The only photo of harper that's in the old yeah, there's a whole set. He, he was blind, and yet there's a whole series of photo portraits. So he must have been interested in photography, but he couldn't see the photos. So again, it's that kind of, it's interesting. But yeah, he, he did more than one portrait session. Um, so he's one of the students of the Belfast Heart Society. So this is the, this is, he's the result of those efforts to set up societies in the early 19th century. So Arthur, he wasn't taught by Arthur O'Neill. He's a generation later. So Arthur O'Neill taught a set of students, and one of Arthur O'Neill's blind students was Valentine Rennie, and about, I think it was Valentine Rennie that taught Patrick Byrne. So this photo was taken in 1850, when Patrick Byrne was touring in Edinburgh. So what can you see on the photo? How is he dressed? Mm. I'm not sure it's that formal, you know, for 1850, yeah. I think that's yeah, kind of ordinary, modern, yeah, sure. that's streetwear, yeah, I mean, yeah. His, his trousers are not particularly smart, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, his harp is very modern, I mean, it's set up as an early Irish harp, he had Macaulay on his harp, but it's quite a modern harp in, in terms of its shape, you know. He's holding it on the floor, the harp's tall, so it comes up high, and his hands are low. Left hand high, right hand low. And have a photo of the harper with his fingers on the string, that's very cool. So you can spend a lot of time getting a close up of this and looking at how he's shaping his fingers and hands and trying to imitate it to try and understand how he's holding onto the strings. Okay. I'm telling you, yes? that part that he said, I think it's by Eden. Yes. Are there any of those that still survive? Yes. Or in Playable? Yeah. Are in theory, yes. But I don't, there's none that are actually currently in working order. There's there's one that I've heard of, and I'm not going to say where it is or who has it. But it's I, I, people have been chasing Patrick Byrne's heart for a while, and I was in correspondence with a person who claimed to have it, and I think they're right, because I, I looked at a photo they had, and it ma the decoration matches, so I think this person really does have Patrick Byrne's heart but they were um, an avant-garde kind of pop performing artist. And they played, they had Patrick Byrne's heart, they had it strung with gut strings, and this would be a generation or so ago. And they were, and they were this avant-garde performing artist. They played in a, in a band, you know, with a random selection of instruments, sort of like didgeridoo, electric bass, um, drum kit, Chinese mandolin, um, and they were dressed in strange costumes. And this person, I think they dressed in a bear costume. And they did this kind of weird, sort of psycho pop stuff, playing Patrick Burns' heart first. Like, wow, you know, like, how freaky can it get? So, but anyway, they it's, it's not in working on and out. They, they haven't got it working now. But. So, yeah, there's, there's quite a few of those left, but they're, yeah. they're not in working on it. They could be made so, because they're not as old and fragile as the, as the real old yeah. hearts. Yeah. I just wonder how they would have come to put it inside. Not as good, yeah. because of the way they're made, yeah. But they, you know, they're student harps, so they do the job for the harps students. Okay, so we're basically out of time. Do you want to, do you want to talk about the revival for ten minutes, for five minutes? I don't, I don't want to run on too late, because I know we get dinner before we go to the concert. We are the revival. So, so very quickly for ten minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so, so, we are the revival. <laughs> so the harp tradition died out. Why did it die out? Yeah, people stop playing it. Why is that? Because, because it's boring, because the music's not very interesting, doesn't sound very nice. Does so the age of nine exist? Because there were new hearts. Yeah, so. Get in new stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, so new stuff was coming in, and the old guys couldn't keep up. I mean, they tried. So, Caroline's keeping up by, by composing new styles, but they couldn't keep going. So, eventually, it kind of, you know, when, when it gets to old, blind, when it gets to poor blind boys being taught to play the harp, you know that it's not in a healthy situation. So, the harp tradition came to an end. And at the same you know time, oh, sorry. yeah, go on. Do you know any blind harpers? Do I know any blind yeah. harpers? No, but there are some around. Yeah. I, I keep trying to get in touch with them to 
talk to it and how, how they work. Well, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, the it's senses of Yeah, exactly. If you, if, you, if you come across by people who are interested in this, it's worth trying no, to get them on board. It's worth it about I'm actually kind of having a pet project, but it requires me to sit in one place for longer. I thought you were going to say it teaching. requires you. No, 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 no. To start teaching blind children the higher I want to do it, but you know, I can't just start doing it and then after two months decide to move somewhere else. Yes. So the heart died out. At the same time, there was this great upsurge in romantic nationalism. And this is what Ita talked about. Everybody was passionate about, about ancient Ireland. The harp of Erin is unstrung. And what they meant by that was the Irish nation is under political oppression. And the half of Erin should be strung anew and heard throughout the land. And what they mean by that is we need to rise against the, uh, the oppressors in London who are taking all our taxes and uh, politically oppressing us. So it's all codes, you see. So at the same time, they didn't care about the old harp music as music, because they wanted new music, but they did care about the idea, the, the symbolism of it. And so what happens is you get brand new instruments invented that are new instruments but they look old. You can tell they look old because they're painted green and they have shamrocks on them. Okay. So this is the new instrument, and this is the Egan harp. Uh, we have an Egan harp in the house here. It doesn't work, so tomorrow it's, um, we'll pull it out and show you if you're interested in seeing it. Um, and basically, this caught new imagination. And so this, this carried on, and this is the basis of, of everyday modern Irish harp music. Okay. It's a new instrument. It basically works according to modern music. It's a modern sound. It's not connected to the ancient traditions at all, but it kind of looks it. Yeah. In Scotland, they have the same thing. Anyone know who this is? This is. This is. Um... Yes, come in. Sorry. This is Margaret MacLean Clefane, and she was an aristocratic Scottish lady. And she was, she was romantically attached to the idea of revitalising ancient Scottish harp music as part of this kind of cultural renewal. And she thought, um, it's ancient harp music, I must play it on the harp. So she got a big <coughs> orchestral pedal harp to play it on. Because it's a harp. And there's only one type. Yeah? So, I mean, you know, that, that was the attitude then. They didn't get it, or... They thought that the, obviously the orchestral pedal harp is an improvement on the ancient harp, so obviously you'd want to use the better instrument. So, so, that's, so that's the way she did it. And I love this painting by Ray you know, it, it encapsulates that whole idea. But you know, she was doing the real thing. She, she was going out. She lived on Mull. She was going out into the villages. She found old singers who, whose grandparents had heard old harpers, who, whose whose parents and grandparents had, uh, uh, were related to the old Bardic families. She collected tunes and songs off them. She wrote them in her notebook. She sang these old Gaelic harp songs with her harp accompaniment. She was really trying to do the right thing, but just didn't kind of get it. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is that in the early 19th century? Yeah, it's so 1810, that kind of time. All of that would be a solid... Um, I love this one. Tradition this, is, um, this is Annie Gray, 1899. So, so this, is kind of, this is kind of how it goes, you know. You, the music's modern, the dress is modern, the playing style is modern. Which way around is she holding the harp? Right high, of course, because it's a modern harp, basically. It's, got, so it's, it's a modern harp with gut strings, you play chords on it, it's got the mechanisms at the top so you can do sharps and flats and change keys. But it looks ancient, yeah? You can clearly see this is modelled on the Trinity harp and the Queen Mary harp. So it's, so it's a... It's a modern harp that, that's pretending to be ancient, but it's not. And this, and this theme carries on all the, way, all the way up to the present day with, with people going out there with, with modern instruments, kind of tapping into the allure of the ancient tradition, but not getting it, I think. Okay? So does that, does that make sense? You understand this, this difference between these two traditions? So, so all the time, there were some people who said, no, 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 that's not right. They don't get it. This modern instrument is not the ancient harp. And so this lady, she, she kind of half gets it. 
What can you tell me about her heart? This is, this is 1892. What can you tell me about her heart? I like the, sorry, the lamb on It's not a replica of the lamb on heart, but it's not bad, is it? It's, it's an attempt in that direction. You can see it's got a one piece carved stone box, hasn't got any mechanisms. It's got brass wire strings. Okay. So she gets it, but the old, in, old heart, what the old heart's like. She's, she's commissioned a replica of old heart. However, she doesn't quite get it because she's playing it back to front. And she's still trying to play modern style with chords and everything. But, so she's got the instrument, but she hasn't got the old style, the old approach. And it's no surprise, that doesn't really work. And so this, this attempt at a revival of the, of the old heart tradition doesn't go anywhere. It's only about three or four years, and they stop using these and switch to the, to the, um, to the gut string modern style harps. Okay. This is 1937. This is Mabel Dolmetsch. Arnold Dolmetsch was uh, really important in England. He, was, he did lots of work with harpsichords and lutes and, and all those ancient European instruments, getting them up and running again, discovering the old music, the old playing styles. Oh, it's all, it's all the recorder. recorder, yeah. Arnold Dolmetsch got the recorder back up and running. And now the recorder is played all over the place. Anyway, Arnold Dolmetsch made this harp with brass wire strings. It's a bit skinny. But, you know, he did his best, and Mabel learned to play it. She grew her fingernails, and she looks at Bunting's books to try and understand she, you know, the ornaments and everything. She still plays it the wrong way around, and she's still playing too many chords. She's still got too much of a modern style. You know, she's, they're starting to grope towards an idea that, look, we've got this ancient instrument, we've got an ancient repertory, we need to start putting it together. So, you know... And she didn't you know, make it a new one. Sorry? Yeah. Um, so the bar, uh, not, not the, the bar, 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 the and, uh, and they, they worked with the doll matches. Right. Yeah, she mentioned, when well, I first got interested in the harps, it's all Mabel used to play one. And she, and she talked about that. And she also did did, did she ever hear Mabel play this? Yes, she did. What did she say? Well, all, all she actually told me was that, um, that she didn't, hadn't used what we used to call, I know, half players, guitarists called the third thing. <coughs> didn't use the third, kept it to Just these three. Yeah. Yeah. middle. Which, um, so he had an attempt, an attempt to try and reconstruct an yeah. old painting. Well, Dolmetsch was very interested in all those things, and, and, and that's, I've never seen that photograph before. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 have, I have a reminiscence about Mabel as well. Um, do you remember I showed you the photograph of Tristram's harp? Yeah. With all of us standing behind it. And the people, the, the people in that photograph was Tristram and his wife Anne, Sharon and me, and Tristram's good friend, Leighton Ring, and Leighton's wife, Leighton Ring's a very old man, he must be 80 or 85, and he came up to, to meet us, because he's, he's a Law, William Law scholar, he's a scholar of the Irish harp in English music. And, um, and so, she, so we sat in Tristram's living room, Tristram was already ill by this time, he knew that he was going to die, so this was, he was starting to donate this stuff to the, to the harp society. And, um, and so there was, there, was, there was the big, the harp that's down there, this, this, the, the, the Tristram's chromatic harp. And so Siobhan was starting to tune it up and starting to try playing a few pieces on it. And Leighton rings her hand washing and, and, in, and in the end Leighton says, yes, I remember the sound, the, the harp that sounds like this. I remember when we were going for dancing lessons at Jess's, which is the name of Arnold Dormich's house. And he said, we would, go, we would go past the kitchen on the way to the dance studio. And I remember hearing Mabel playing. So, wow. so Siobhan tuning and playing Tristram's harp triggered that memory in his ear of having heard Mabel playing. And this would be in the 50s, I think, just before Mabel died. But I thought that was very special to have that direct connection back to her. It's very nice, though. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a recording of Mabel made in 37, and I was going to play it on the CD player, but I can't find CDs. So. Let's take the problem. Yeah. Perhaps I'll fiddle around for 10 minutes and dig it out when we finish the lecture and then anyone who's still around can hear it. Because I need to finish because we're running over massively. Okay, okay last picture. Oh, who's this person? Um, I, I asked Anne quite a little while ago what was the oldest picture of her that she could find of her with the harp descending. And she sent me this. And um, she, she, said, she said it's a bit of a fake picture because this is from so long ago. She'd only been playing a few years and she never did public performances. This is, this is like 76 or something like that. 
1976. So she only ever played with Charlie. He would play guitars and things, and she would just kind of strum along because she was still learning. But I thought, how sweet to see a picture of her with her first. With her, this is her very first harp, but she doesn't have any more. So, and Anne, you see, which way she ran is she playing? She's playing on the left. She's got the replica Otway harp, so she got it right from the beginning. And so the work that she did has carried on. And so I, I think that Anne starting like this is the real start of our modern revival. Okay, there were people doing it before then, but it didn't follow through, it didn't build up the momentum. But the work that Anne does, Anne started then, did. Okay, and most of the people who are playing early Irish harp nowadays got their inspiration directly or indirectly from the work that Anne's doing. So that's why I wanted to finish with this picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's me, that's me done. Any, any comments or questions? We should finish and you should disappear off to get your dinner. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.